Guy, welcome to Talk Python. Thanks. Happy to be here. Yeah, it's fantastic to have you here. I'm really excited to talk about buildings and architecture and, you know, that kind of stuff just permeates our lives, right? That's you walk around, you go to cities, you marvel at the large buildings, go to someone's house, and it's this beautiful place. Really nice to see all that starts with good architecture and design, right? Yeah, that's right. Where we live, where we work, pretty much uh, most of our lives we'll spend we'll spend inside uh, some sort of structure. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Cool. Well, we're going to talk about that. Before we get into that, though, let's just start with your story. How did you get into programming in Python? Yeah, it was it was a bit of a long journey to Python. Um, my I think my first experience with programming was actually uh, with a Lego Mindstorm. I don't know if you're familiar with it. Well, yeah. A little um, robot thing, right? You can, you yeah. can program those with Python, can't you? Yeah, you know, I don't know what it looks like these days. I guess when I got it, uh, it was maybe, yeah, in my early teenage years or something. And at the time, they had something that was similar to MIT's Scratch, you know, kind of block, mm -hmm. uh, plug yeah. and play. Um, so I did a little bit of that. And then uh, early, uh, later, I, try, I tried to learn um, Visual Basic 6, I think also in my you know, early teenage years. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was, that was fun. I built a couple little personal projects you know but, what i i, I yeah. feel like we still don't have something to take the place of visual basic six yeah yeah do you do you think so i mean i i look around at all the different ui platforms whether that's the stuff we have in python or whether that's swift or whether that's you know dot net with wpf or whatever else you want to talk about nothing is as easy as I want these buttons here in a text box and a list and I double click it and I write three lines of code and that happens, right? Yeah, the, the environment has changed, right? Because before there were just desktop apps, right? You would build it and, mm -hmm. and that's it. And now you have to think about, you know, even if, 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 you know, React has made it as easy to, you know, build front end app, you still have to deal with something else for styling and then you have to figure it out. You know, how are you going to serve the data or are you going to deploy it to? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm right. not saying VV6 is the pinnacle of <laughs> yeah. what we could design, right? It's it's not going to win massive design awards, but yeah. wow, could people get stuff done quickly with that that framework? Yeah, and I mean, so I, you, I started, never, you did a little bit there, huh? Yeah, I never got too deep, but it was an extension of a robotics course that I was taking. So we were building these little UIs and then mm -hmm. clicking around and having the you know robot move or something. Um, so it was very, very basic UI. Um, but what was interesting is, you know, at the time I, I grew up in Brazil and at the time I was still there and I, I wanted to get really deep, but there was this, there was a bit of a language barrier, I think, you know, this was also, you know, pre Google. So mm. trying to learn how to program while also not knowing how to speak English, I actually feel like it slowed me down a bit. Yeah, I can and, imagine. Um, I've always had a lot of both <laughs> respect and I guess a little bit of sympathy for people who are non native English speakers, especially people who didn't particularly speak English super well, but then had to program with for loops and while loops yeah, and yeah. true and false and ints. And it's just like, if, you know, maybe if you're with a language that's not that different, it, it's, it's not that hard, but you know, if you're like Chinese or even Portuguese, it's, you know, why do you have to program in all these foreign words? Yeah. It, it just seems crazy to me that that's how it has been, right? Yeah, and, and also the, you know, the resources. Um, even today with, yeah. you know, post-Google era or during the Google era, you can, you, you know, if you search for a, a some sort of engineering problem in English or in Portuguese, I can guarantee you, you're going to get a much bigger <laughs> pull of, you know, uh, answers and resources in English. So, yeah, um, yeah. Yeah, that, that was a that was a little bit of a barrier. And in fact, what actually happened is I never really progressed, and I just went on to other things, you know. Um, and All right, maybe this programming thing's not for me, huh? That was yeah. I, I don't know. I guess yeah. I I just kind of didn't really get it. Never really clicked, and then I mm -hmm. yeah moved on to other things and um, ended up pursuing a you know degree in architecture. You know, to, we'll talk a little bit about it, but uh, it was a little bit of kind of a gap. And then I think it was it was just you know during my my college years I tried getting into a little bit of web development, you know, played around with action script, uh, you know, flash, or I think that's what it was called, right? It was like JavaScript, like instead yeah. of flash. And, and then within architecture, I, I got a little bit into like visual programming. 
um, which, you know, it's, it's I, I guess, a more sophisticated version of, you know, Scratch, but similar to what uh, 3DS Max uses to compose material, you know, this mm -hmm. idea that you can kind of connect, you know, flows into each other visually. And that's used pretty extensively in architecture still. And that was kind of my, my, my gateway back into uh, programming in some ways. And... And then a couple of years later, I actually practiced architecture for, I think, about five or six years. And uh, at the time, I was trying to figure out how I could change careers. And I, I was just, I had this kind of, you know, itch. I just really wanted to write code, and I yeah. couldn't figure out how to kind of break it. And I ended up doing this process of changing careers. I actually took a year off and spent every kind of breathing minute I had trying to learn how to code. And wow. Surprisingly, was that actually, on, on your own, or did you go to a university, or yeah, how? It was just on my own. Yeah. yeah, literally, like Google. You know, what language should I learn first? You know, <laughs> and this was like 2014, I think, mm -hmm. 15, and and I actually picked Ruby first. You know, this was you know Ruby on Rails, you know, yeah, golden years, I guess. And I I started with Ruby, and after a couple of weeks, I I just didn't enjoy it that much. I, I was getting confused with some of the basic kind of building blocks. And I decided to try Python, and it was just kind of smooth sailing. I mean, I guess yeah. as smooth as it can be learning by yourself. Yeah, yeah, sure. But, you know, I felt like uh, even the basic grammar, it would just kind of stick. You know, I didn't have to keep going back and say, oh, how is it? How do you do for loop again? You know, I, I found that it was always a bit stickier with me, you know, uh, not having to think about where some semicolons would go, you know. Um, yeah. And it, was, it was just easier and smoother and more enjoyable for me in general. For sure. Well, I gave uh, VB a lot of uh, positive praise a little bit ago. I think also that language is a really interesting example of how to try to be like Python, but not do it well. So with JavaScript or C Sharp or a lot of these languages, you have all these symbols on the screen, especially the static yeah. languages, C Sharp, Java, C++, right? Semicolons, angle brackets, you know, parentheses, all sorts of stuff all over the place. And then there's languages like Python that say, you know, you don't need that. You don't need all these symbols. Let's just yeah. go and write it. And, you know, VB is like that, right? There's no semicolons. There's not that many symbols. But so, it's like everything is begin for, end for. Like, it's just, it's book it's the worst possible. It's like they still need yeah. the closing curly braces and stuff like that, but they don't want to put a curly brace. So they make you type like a huge long word, which is, is crazy. And, and somehow Python struck that like smooth balance of not having all that stuff, but not giving up too much as well. Yeah. And also the, you know, the, the boilerplate that that's required, you know, I, I think I had tried, I tried doing some C sharp as well. And, you know, you open up the simplest example you can find and it's, you know, class you know <laughs> void public and you're like wait what is public <laughs> like yeah you know you I, I haven't gone to understand you know classes or you know access and things yeah, like that and, and it's really overwhelming um mm -hmm. and in python it's like e even the class you know it, it takes a little bit when you're learning but you can just you know here's a function that's inside of this object and it's much easier yeah. to understand i think as a beginner to kind of ramp up i think it's a big testament that you can be really effective with Python with a, a super, like, like a very partial understanding of what Python is or how it works, right? You can right. not even be aware that half of the stuff exists and you can still get along just fine. So uh, that's pretty awesome. So let's dive into the main topic, buildings, architecture. So I've seen some of the presentations you've given and it sounds to me like this is a industry that's ripe for more programming automation empowerment you know i always say that programming is a superpower for people who have, are not programmers right if you're an architect versus an architect who programs the programming architect can do way more right oh, and yeah. it, it sounds to me like uh, this area is kind of open for more of that yeah yeah absolutely yeah give us the background yeah, think... so it starts with pictures and drawings and blueprints type things right yeah yeah exactly so i mean i i guess i should I should just preface this with the fact that you know I've been outside the industry for uh, about you know four years now. You know, just doing more traditional software development. So I may be you know a little bit of the loop on some some changes, but you know in general, the time I spent in the industry, uh, you know what you would see is that it's still a pretty 
kind of analog industry and, and there are parts that are improving there are parts that are you know very advanced i mean we do still manage to build incredible buildings but there's this weird kind of tension where you know people are coming up with these design concepts and figuring out you know what this what the building is going to look like what spaces you're going to need and then kind of at the other end you have like people like standing on their you know like literally cutting material and you know assembling things yeah and then there's this big kind of gap in the middle of how you go from one thing to another and you know that's kind of the the, the meat of architecture uh so my experience was primarily you know in, in medium and, and large buildings and it's actually just very um labor intensive you know labor uh as far as software not not the hands-on labor for architects yeah. but there's just a lot of uh work that goes into designing a big building you know so if you have a i don't know one of the office buildings i worked on you know 150,000 square feet six story or something and you know someone had come up with the design okay it's going to look like this and it was very you know conceptual design yeah. kind of massive and then you have to turn into this into a real project with, uh, you know, faucets that work and lights and sprinklers and exactly. When you think, well, let me rephrase that. When I think of architecture, I think of the overall feel of it. Right? right. Is it is it flowing? Does it have sharp edges? Does it feel modern? Yeah. Right. And so on. I have a picture here on the screen for us to look at. That's this you know, sort of wood structure, it's light and airy. And sure, that's architecture, but it sounds like, and so are the support beams, so is the plumbing, so is the light switch and where they go, uh, and just way more detail than just the general skeleton or structure out there. Yeah, right? and like which, you know, which part of the plywood is going to go in which direction, like on your, you know, on your kitchen counter or something, you know, that, like right. that level of detail. But what you're what you're showing here, it's kind of what you see in school uh, and what you get really excited about in school. And then when you start working, you realize that there's only <laughs> a few people that get to do this type of work. And the majority of the people are just, yeah. you know, uh, you know, kind of doing coordination and 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 working on, you know, lots of kind of drawings and, and coordination between different trades um but you know of course that, that does happen but uh a big chunk of the work is just figuring out how to coordinate and, and assemble drawings so if you imagine you know a lot of this work is done on kind of traditional desktop applications so you know if you're familiar with autodesk uh the biggest ones in the us are you know autocad revit uh those are more uh uh, Revit is very like architecture and kind of building focused. AutoCAD is more kind of generic, uh, you know, uh, drawing and drafting. And then you have other players like, you know, MacNeil, they do kind of 3D modeling and it's used all the way from small jewelry design and boats all the way to buildings, but more at the conceptual stage. And Revit is kind of the big, you know, the big dog as far as like building documentation. And there's this interesting process because at the same time you are coming up with the building at large scale, right? Like what you see there, this kind of mass in, you have to zoom in all the way to, you know, uh, what is it going to look like, uh, you know, the, the light cove in a bathroom, for example, and mm -hmm. you might have to cut a section through that in detail. And there's this weird process we are still in where buildings are designed half in 3D and half in 2D. So you do some 3D and then you get sort of these views. But then you and might you do a in. projection. You're like, oh, we need to see just this wall, yeah, yes. and, so, or just so like, the floor. How it's going to look. assemble this case work needs a drawing of like, what does it look like if I cut through here? And you literally draw in 2D, and you have to assemble these big drawing sets that are references. You know, that show the 3D and say, okay, if you were to cut through this, here's what you would see. And oftentimes they're not even like the same model. You're just trying to, you yeah. know, make this thing look, you know, coordinated. How, how often does it go wrong? Oh, Maybe. pretty often. Yeah, yeah, pretty often. So one of the things that's done, uh, usually there's a tool called Navisworks is one of the ones that's used that's for clash detection. So because not only you have the architects, but you also have these trades coming together, right? So you have separate models for the architecture, like walls and floors and, and things like that. And then you have the structural engineer has a separate model with all the steel or con concrete structure and maybe the, you know, MEP uh, mechanical electrical and plumbing uh, folks have a separate model and then they all get linked and in the end you may have like you know a duck going through a light fixture or you know uh, yeah. 
things cutting through all and you actually have to do clash detections and trying to figure out uh, places where the model may not, may not have a kind of a valid condition. Yeah, I can imagine. So this Revit app is largely a .NET C Sharp desktop application. Is that right? Yeah, correct. Yeah, and so yeah, a, if, if you want a programmer to work with it, what do you do? Do you do that in C Sharp? Yeah, so Revit's been around for a while. Um, and I, I'm not sure when it started. I don't think it was from the very beginning. But at some point, they released, you know, they released an API. And, you know, without this API, you, you, you can do everything through the UI, right? So you can click around and um, you, you can basically achieve everything you need to. And through the API, you can sort of automate everything that's visible and sometimes a little bit more. Um, but the idea is that, you know, for example, one of the first uh, one of the first tasks I automated in Revit was uh, I was working on really large office buildings, and each room would get a tag with like the name of the room, and right. I would have to literally drag this tag on. And then sometimes as the building moved, things would get kind of out of place, and you wanted the tags to be kind of centered nicely, and you would literally have to go around and move around these tags. And uh, one of the first For hundreds scripts, of rooms, right? That sounds like yeah. not a, not a fun, good use of your time. Oh no, definitely not at all. And yeah, one of the f first automations I built was this tool that would just go automatically room by room and make sure that the tag was in the center. So we just kind of figured out the delta between the center of the room and where the tag was and like slide it. And yeah. you know, I, I actually had at the company that I worked at the time, I had a system that would measure the use of tools. And that tool would just get used like hundreds of times a day. So you imagine every time someone clicked that button, you know, <laughs> the amount of time you would see these architects like going around and moving these you know, tags to get them center. Uh, and ju just little things like that, very kind of monotonous, you know, uh, boring, not not very impressive. Yeah, but those but are the kinds of things that you can. Time on the day -to -day. Yeah, but you can easily apply code to those, and really make people's lives better. And it sounds like hundreds of people's lives better by, you know, ma not making them fiddle with stupid labels all the time, but you just oh, yeah. push a button, right? So while it, these can be programmed in C sharp, they're there's a Python angle, right? Yeah. Yeah. So there's 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 a couple of different ways that Python comes in. I think Revit itself does support some sort of Python automation, uh, but it's it's again it's, it's a bit bulky, difficult to use, difficult to debug. So uh, one of the main ways uh, that it's used these days there's there's this project, and I've actually become um, really good friends with the maintainer. Uh, but there's this project called PyRevit, and you know the idea is that when you write Python, you you get used to things being you know uh, sort of Pythonic or more elegant, and it's kind of easy easy to to do, right? So what he was trying to do is how can we have this kind of experience building automations within Revit? So instead of having to compile you know my my C sharp add in, how can I kind of just pop up the script, click a button, and have it run you know my Python code? And that's essentially you know what he built. So uh, initially, it was it was using only Iron Python because that's the way it integrates uh, within within the Revit environment. Since it's .NET, uh, you would essentially using Iron Python, you could interact directly with Revit through the common language runtime. Right. But, so tell us a bit about Iron Python. I suspect many people do know about it. This came originally out of a project at Microsoft. I think was this Dino Veland. I can't remember. Yeah, that's what I've heard. I, I've interacted with the maintainers a couple times over the last few years, and the impression I've had is that there was one or two people kind of trying to get this going, uh, but it's not very active. Uh, and I think the three, the three release uh, wasn't until oh yeah, it, so it shows there it's still in alpha actually. At the time <laughs> when I was using it, it was still on two point seven. You know, it's been yeah. stuck there for a long time. At least it's making progress. I mean, here's a release in twenty twenty one on it, so that's good. Yeah, the, you know the the one of the things I, I'm not too familiar with it, but I remember hearing from the PyRevit uh, maintainer that they actually ended up using this other project called Python.net. Yes. And you know, Iron Python is essentially a a, a a Python interpreter that you know it's written in C sharp, and Python.net does something kind of different. It actually allows you to use C Python but interact with the .NET side, and I, I don't quite remember how it worked, but I know he got it to work. And he was yeah. able to get C Python applications running inside of Revit as well. Right. So Iron Python is a Python interpreter, 
but instead of having the interpreter implemented in C the way that the one that we're all mostly familiar with is, yeah. it's implemented on top of .NET. And yeah, that was Dino Vila in a double check. So uh, nice job on that, Dino. Um, and it's implemented on top of the .NET CLR runtime, and it's kind of its own little thing in this thing called the dynamic language runtime, which means integration with .NET is super easy because it's already running in .NET. It's equivalent to saying integration with C is easy on C Python because it's already effectively running in C, right? And I guess that's probably a pretty natural way to go because if you're trying to integrate with a C Sharp .NET library, you got to somehow get that thing in and do something with it, right? Yep. So I could see why they would go with Iron Python first, but yeah, Python. I've I've sort of heard that Python .NET is it seems a little bit more C Python friendly, I guess. Yeah, I think one of the issues with with uh, you know Iron Python project is that it's it's kind of impossible to maintain. Like, how do you keep up with <laughs> yeah. all the changes and releases of C Python and like rebuild them from scratch? You know, in Iron Py in in uh, C Sharp, I would imagine it's it's it would take a huge amount of time and resources to keep that project like going. You know, in the same yeah. pace. Yeah. So here, looking at Python.net, we've got it supports two seven, but also three five, three six, three seven, and three eight, which is not three nine and three ten, yeah. but it sure is better than alpha support for three four. <laughs> So, yeah. yeah, are you? Do you know how it actually like what it actually does? How does it I, get? To I it? have no. I have not learned enough about Python.net to know how it works. But it's yeah, it, it looks pretty neat though, doesn't it? Yeah, but I think it's just a. It's you know you're you're able to operate in C Python, but kind of import common language runtime and talk to your your uh, .NET DLLs in the same way you would uh, from from Iron Python. So it's, it's yeah, pretty you get very foreign looking code. Import CLR from system.winstows.forms import form, which is something you would expect to see in a .NET project, not in a Python project. Yeah, you know, but that, there's actually that's one interesting thing that I've seen happen quite a bit because people within you know the this industry ended up using Iron Python quite a quite a bit. I know there's a, there's a few projects out there for building UIs in Python, but mm -hmm. you know, I've actually seen quite a few projects with like desktop UIs basically build. Using you know .NET because it has oh, interesting. You know, uh, uh, what is it? WinForms. I forgot what the yeah, other yeah, yeah. one was. WinForms uh, is the one that's like the the modern-ish VB. I say modern-ish because yeah. I think they kind of stopped advancing that in something like 2008. I think is when they stopped advancing it. So it's not like super modern, but it's it's way more modern than VB six was. So yeah, there's that, and there's WPF, and then some weird. Oh, the, yeah, WPF was the is the more current one right yeah also way harder to use yeah but yeah more more modern one yeah yeah so uh, so what you're saying is you've seen some people write python code that then will do stuff like this to put that kind of ui right. on the screen right, right? okay yeah. yeah and even you know pyrev itself you know had quite a few kind of ui components and they were all just using standard .NET stuff but you know right in, in python yeah and but what's interesting too is in addition to PyRevit, there's a few other projects, and one of them I, you know, I had worked on that's called was called Revit Python Wrapper, and there's another one called Revitron, uh, which all have kind of similar idea, which is like I want to have the Python experience, but you know, using this other kind of stack. So the idea for Revit Python Wrapper is that the the Revit API, it's this very very bulky. Um, you know, C sharp API. It's yeah. it's enormous. It's, There's you can make it do you can make it do its thing in Python, but you you work with the the type names and the function names and yeah. stuff straight out of the the .NET world, right? Which is clearly not Pythonic. Yeah. So your code doesn't to... look or feel like Python, and then the the interfaces and kind of the APIs for the libraries are weird. So like, if I want to just you know query you know this model for a wall. I would have to like build this object, you know, in this kind of like builder pattern, oh, and gosh. Okay. It, you know, it's it's very strange. Like it doesn't feel like Python. So when I started writing that, I would all you know build these little functions that would take the C sharp code and give me like a Python like call yeah. that I could make. Yeah, and that's what this project you know came out from was this idea that I wanted to oh, wrap everything that didn't feel Pythonic to make it like you know. Feel so like you wrote your system. own like your Py Revit wrapper a little bit, that would then make it easier right and make it look feel more natural and then you yeah so at the time i was writing i was writing python code and the pyrevit was sort of a 
it was kind of the environment. So the idea for PyRevit is you would you could literally just save this .py file in a folder and put a mm -hmm. PNG icon, and it would sort of load it up that file and add it to the Revit ribbon so someone could click on it. And when it clicked, it would load your source code and feed it into the Iron Python engine. So right. it would just help you kind of, you know, establish this 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 environment and you didn't have to compile, you know, an add-in and you know restart Revit. Um, and then Revit Python wrapper was that when every script that I had, I would just import Revit Python wrapper and then just say, you know, um, uh, collector, you know, type equals wall, and it would query for every wall in the model. Uh, and I, I stopped working on this project for a while, and then I recently ran into this Revitron, which is a much more kind of sophisticated version, but essentially the same idea. People wanted to write uh, very clean Python, but operate kind of on top of the Revit API without having to deal with the non kind of Python, you know, look and feel. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. And even has its own CLI. Oh, right yeah. Now. Yeah. It's very yeah nice. I guess it, it integrates with the Pi Revit CLI, right? So, one of the things that's interesting about this, uh, this Pi Revit, which if I go farther enough back, I'll find it, uh, is that you can use Python to build these little toolbar buttons or widgets, right? Yeah. yeah. And the way you do it is, uh, as you sort of described, there's th this super convention of, all these directory, this directory structure, right? Like if, if you put this file there and then the Python file in like some location, it can, it'll trigger the discovery that'll then create like a, some kind of icon and action right. in there, right? Maybe tell us about that a bit. Yeah, and under the hood, you know, if you were to write this in C Sharp, there would be a whole bunch of boilerplate that you would have to add for how those buttons get instantiated and loaded into the UI. And, uh, you know, one thing that I've sort of witnessed, like, seen PyRevit project grow. You know, I was one of the kind of early users, adopters, and you, you, it was this huge barrier um, for people who wanted to automate Revit because you had to learn C Sharp and the add-ins were difficult to build. Mm -hmm. and, you know, it, it was just this big kind of you probably had to learn interfaces and how to implement them and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, and like you had to, you know, you had to go around like the little, you know, the compile settings and think around with it to get it to work. And you had to compile for different versions of Revit. And it was really difficult, um, at least for me. For, maybe it's easier for some people. But <laughs> with PyRevit, you could literally just duplicate this folder and open a new Python file, start messing with it. And every time you click, it would rerun. You wouldn't even have to reload anything because you would just read the source code and feed it to the Iron Python interpreter. So for the first time, I felt like I had this ability to kind of iterate quickly and, and explore and test things out. Yeah. Um, so it was a totally different experience. Yeah, that's great. I'm looking at the code sample here for, uh, for PyRivet, the create your first command example. And I see exactly what you're talking about with this sort of C sharp abstractions leaking into the Python world, yeah, right? Yeah, there's definitely it, a little bit. <laughs> yeah, because it says, "Oh, look how easy it is to build this. You just drop this in this here, and you put your your Python file um, in the folder that is like your button where it contains your icons, and and then you write capital DB capital, you know." Capital F filtered, capital E element, capital collector. So filtered element collector of da da da. And right, it's it's um, real similar to what you would expect from that language. That language is idioms and yeah, not Python know, idioms, right? Revit Python wrapper. I started wrapping these classes. So for example, the filtered element collector. I mean, that's a pretty mm -hmm. long name that I wouldn't give it to a Python class usually. So I just yeah. called it the collector. And okay. I created a class that wrapped the filtered element collector. So instead of writing something like this, you would say, you know, collector uh, type equals wall. And you could write, you know, wall as a, you know, as an enum. And it would sort of basically output this code that you're seeing there. But the problem is you can't really avoid it because even though you wrapped collector, there are like 8,000 other like C sharp classes that I'm not going to wrap them individually. Yeah. So like eventually it just kind of leaks. You just can't, you know, you can't do yeah. the whole thing. Yeah. Somewhere there's some function you can't get in front of and it returns one of these things. And then yeah, exactly. and there it is. Right. Exactly. And I try, you know, I, I tried at some point I had these, you know, uh, wrappers that would take the return and wrap those into some sort of generic wrapper and you would get so complicated and people that, 
you know, they, they couldn't figure out what it was doing. So in that, that's why that Revit Python project ended up just kind of being abandoned at some point. And I, you know, I wasn't as involved with it anymore. So it just kind of mm-hmm. sat there, but uh, you know, that was the idea. If you look at an example for that one, you see that it looks a lot more, um, a lot more Python like. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Let's, uh, let's find a quick example. Maybe I'll go check out the tests. How's that? Yeah, I, I'm clearly seeing stuff that looks more like Python in here. It's <laughs> fantastic, right? Like, you know, uh, variable names. Another thing that you spoke about that um, I, I don't even know what you were doing to solve this, but you said that you had to somehow adapt to things like out parameters and ref parameters, which is a certain way to have a, instead of doing pass by value, to so you can actually modify the reference itself in the parameter. It's a little bit like a passing a pointer to a pointer in C yeah. or something like that, where you can change the pointer itself inside the function. What what did they do in Python to deal with that? That's yeah. So I don't so know how to do that in Python. Iron, Iron Python has a special. I don't remember because it's been. Oh, around. okay. Iron, so Iron, in Iron Python, there's like construct. an out or something. Okay. Yeah. Got it. So you import some special Iron Python object, and and that becomes your reference, and you pass that. Um, so, you know, Iron Python has these is these weird kind of. Uh, ways of handling those differences. What, what's, diff- what's difficult is that it's, it's a very niche thing. So when you run into a problem with, with those, there's not a whole lot of people like trying to solve this, you know? So it was always a little bit difficult too. I've, I've had that sort of scenario before and it's, it's not very often fun. And I remember specifically one time there was something I was trying to do with this code and it just was not responding in any way that I expected. And I was, I was at my wits end. I'm like, I'm just going to Google this. I'm just going to just find whatever I can. And the only answer I could find was a blog post I wrote about it six months ago. I'm like, well, that's it. <laughs> We're done. There's, there's no hope for me now. Because I'm sure I've tried. I can't do it. And I, the only thing I can find is some dumb blog post that didn't really answer the question I wrote about it. So here we go. So yeah, tell, the, yeah, so well, tell me about it. Yeah, go ahead. The, on Iron Python, a couple of times I had issues. My only resource was to go into the GitHub project and actually post an issue. And I said, you know, there's a Stack Overflow question, no responses. I'm completely at lost here. You know. Yeah. And, well, that's such one of the such a big challenge of using one of these sort of niche interpreters or runtimes, because when you need help, there's no one to help you and. If it comes down to some little weird internal behavior, right? That behavior might be different. And just because people, they'll tell you, well, that's how it works in CPython. You're like, well, I know, but that's not how it works for me right now. Right. Can you help me? Like, no, I don't know anything about that, right? It's it's a challenge. Yeah, and, and if you're trying to, you know, post a reproducible example in Stack yeah. Overflow and you have to have, you know, Revit open, for example, to execute this, um, you know, if you're if you're trying to deal with some like nuance of Iron Python within this environment, it's it's really really difficult. Yeah, oh my gosh, yeah, I I can see why you would want to get away from it. And I'm guessing that Python.net makes this easier, but maybe it's maybe it's still the same. I'm not entirely sure. I I would like to learn more about that one, but just, yeah, same here. Yeah, let's see. I, I'm the live streamer. Just want to say, hey, Bavani said um, finally could catch up on the live stream here. Big fan of Python, and just you know, people listening, if you get the chance to be great for you to drop by the live stream we do on YouTube. Just go to talkpython.fm slash YouTube. YouTube can be part of it. It's always fun to get input from everyone out there. All right. Give us some examples of the types of things that you are able to do with Python and automating Revit. Uh, I, there's a talk. I'll go ahead and link to the talk that you gave at a meetup in San Francisco at Pine, Pinesula. Hopefully I'm saying that correctly. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And you talked about, there's a lot of nice graphics, and you talked a lot about what you've done at various projects and stuff. Give us some concrete examples. Like, it's all great in practice to say you could automate stuff, but like, what did you actually do? Yeah, so there was there was a lot of those kind of very boring, you know, automating moving tags type of thing. Uh, Some of the other bigger projects I I worked on, you know, at the time I was working at uh, WeWork. Um, This is the fast growth time of WeWork as well, right? Yeah, yeah, that's right. So you know, when I when I when I joined WeWork, it was a relatively small team. I think the building information, you know, 
modeling team, which is the, the team that I had joined, had you know just a handful, like four, five people. And I think the company as a whole was maybe 800. And when I left four years later, they were at around 10,000 employees. Um, oh, and and then the building department, you know, the design building and design department, initially was you know was open in one or two buildings a month. And by the time I left, they were open in you know like 25 or 30. So you know, all, all other kind of you know we were drama side of what happened within the company within the kind of design and architecture department. It was just it was really interesting to see. Yeah. Um, be, you know, because traditionally companies building buildings, they're doing that as a service. So they're, you know, an architecture office that you hire. Yeah. And WeWork was one of those examples where you had this kind of vertical integration. You know, they were the owners, they were the operators, they were the designers, they were the builders, they even bought, you know, uh, they acquired a, a, a general contractor. So you had this huge opportunity to, to optimize and to integrate. So uh, some of the things that we did, like one of the projects I worked there was related to um, uh, in, integrating data from the earlier design process into everything that would happen kind of downstream. So for example, you know, as designers were working on buildings and trying to get them through the approval process, as soon as, as, as this project was sort of starting to materialize, we wanted to get those spaces uh, fed into the kind of sales pipeline. So yeah. we would actually build Revit integrations that would extract data from these, from these models and feed them to other parts of the company. So one of them was related oh, to, yeah, to figuring out how many offices are going to be in this building, how big are they, uh, how many desks are in each one, and essentially integrate that, for example, with Salesforce, so that the sales team could start selling them. Uh, we did things with uh, supply chain as well. So, you know, we had logistics company that would be trying to orchestrate, you know, shipment of, you know. For example, these chairs and couches that you see in the photo, they would need to be placed at warehouses and then delivered to buildings before opening. And they, you know, they turned these buildings around really quickly. So uh, it was really, it was really important that uh, they they had kind of insight. So as people were designing these buildings, we could actually start quantifying what was being used, what was going to be assigned, and then. Uh, get the data sort of out of the model, which is not very, you know, it's essentially a file that sits there. And we would use uh, Python, for example, to quantify these things, pull the data out, and then, you know, send them on to other platforms. So it's sort of a little bit of kind of data wrangling. Yeah. It's like JIT interior design, just in yeah. time, right? Like, exactly. we're going to need this here by Tuesday. So we're, we're going to automate it. So one of the things you have to do is you have to figure out how, you know, maybe describe for I'm sure not everyone's been inside of a WeWork before. Give us a quick sense of like, what does the inside of a WeWork look like? Yeah, so WeWork... Or any, a lot of these co-working spaces, but WeWork is you know probably one of the bigger ones. Yeah, so, so WeWork, you know, they would, they would take, you know, empty floor spaces and they would use sort of, uh, you know, storefronts, it's kind of glass storefronts and subdivide them into small offices, you know, as small as a single desk or, you know, a little kind of cubicle. Uh, and they could be as big as, you know, 15 or 20 person office. And they were really efficient in how they kind of packed these desks. And they would do it in a way that it was very efficient for them. Um, they would pack these offices really close, but then they would create these really nice, you know, beautiful shared common spaces. Yeah. So, uh, you know, when you would walk into WeWork, you would often see these very kind of slick, you know, hip spaces, well-designed music playing, you know. So it was this, this kind of nice experience, this you know, cool kitchen, coffee area. Um, and you, you, I, th I think they were really good at it. You know, I, I got to work out of WeWorks for many years and it was a really nice change from my previous kind of office environment. So even as a product, I, I actually really enjoy what they were building. Nice. Yeah, so one of the things you spoke about is setting up some automation to figure out, well, how should we lay out these these tables, either this open space, like just hangout area tables or... Um, like the the co-working desks or there's some parts that have like glass clear glass separators so you have some some sort of quiet but it's still they've all got to be laid out right and you can say okay if, if we adjust the walls like this or do that then here's here's the arrangement right yeah a, a couple of my co-workers um were trying to figure out how to automate this so that as architects are taking this kind of big floor plate and they're slicing it they're generally trying to figure out how the circulation is going to work and then 
you you know you build these kind of long blocks and then you're going to start subdividing them to offices and then as you start subdividing them and then you got to figure out how the desks are going to work and then you have columns so actually like laying them out and, and getting kind of an efficient algorithm can be you know kind of time consuming so some folks from uh the, the kind of the data and research team uh they were writing algorithms and the first one that i saw was actually written in python um and i think it was served like using a, a flask api but the idea is that you could pass it a polygon and you would apply these rules about how you can lay out desks within this kind of polygon uh, you would say, you know, the door is here, you know, do your best to lay out desks. And you would, you would try to do that. It was, you know, it was fairly straightforward math. It wasn't, you know, uh, artificial intelligence, you know, or some sort of machine learning. It was actually pretty straightforward kind of brute force, you know, if I start laying these out along the edges. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but they, they, were, they were really interesting. Uh, they, they did some really interesting research on that. Yeah, it's cool. A lot of nice examples of what you can do with a little bit of Python, a little bit of automation, even if you've got to somehow mash that together with a, a .NET or, you know, I guess if it was a Java API, you could use Jython or, or some other thing like that, right? Yeah, and this one specifically, the way we, the way we got around it is by actually building it as an API and have a, um, and have a C-sharp add-in called the API to, to do the calculation. So that way we didn't have to <laughs> deal with it. Nice, yeah, that's perfect. All right, and then let's talk about this other thing that you've been working on AEC.works, which is Architectural Engineering and Construction Works. And tell us a bit about this project. This is a website you built for like raising the visibility of cool companies in the space. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So so this this actually started as, you know, when I was a, an engineer at WeWork and I was kind of seeing a lot of really interesting companies kind of start to show up and uh, try to build either software products or kind of try to take a, a technology and, and build a new kind of companies within AC that were, you know, trying to use technology in, in some interesting way. And I started keeping a, a list of it, you know, a Google sheet or Airtable form or something. And I, and I, this list started growing. So it started with, you know, four and five, and eventually I had 20 or 30 of them. And I would often share them in, you know, different uh, kind of community forums. And then I thought it would be interesting if I could somehow make that available and maybe even so that people could contribute and edit them. So uh, basically build this out. It's a, you know, it's a Django kind of traditional, somewhat traditional Django app, except that on the front end, instead of uh, using, you know, templates, I just use uh, Vue.js. So it's, you know, kind of front end, back end separation type project. And uh, yeah, the idea is that you can create uh, these entries that represent these different companies or products and then it just you know it's kind of displays them it's just pretty simple nothing really crazy nice yeah i will highlight a couple just to give people a sense but there's a way to come here and say suggest a company that's doing like innovative work here right so if people are out there like why is my company out here well there's a button right yeah exactly <laughs> all right so i just briefly let's talk about two of them that uh, are maybe noteworthy uh, this so one right at the top of the moment that says is called Speckle. And uh, let's see, it says engineers, designers, and hackers in the entire organization rely on us for interoperability and automation. So it's like source control, collaboration, versioning, notification for architectural uh, construction folks. Yeah, it's it's a little bit like, uh, you know, AC, architecture, engineering, construction, you know, data wrangling on on steroids, right? So, mm -hmm. you know, when you're when you're engine and you know, if you're working with software, you can pretty much always just like make a JSON and pass it around, right? And you can, as long as you can get you know at least some basic data types. Now, if you have to pass around a wall, it's it's much more difficult than just passing around you know a string. And yeah. you know, what type of wall is it? Where is it located? How big it is? You know, it's 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 complicated. So. You have all these different desktop applications, and I've highlighted some that are used primarily within architecture, right? Like, you know, Revit, for example. But there's all these other applications for other disciplines within the, the construction, you know, engineering industry. So, right. Some of the ones they highlight are like Unity, Civil 3D, eTabs, Blender, Unreal, that kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Like Revit. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, the first time, I, the first time Speckle came around, I, I believe it was a, like an academic project. Uh, came out of. Um, 
uh, Europe. And what they would do is they would build, like, for example, you know, an add-in for one of these platforms, and they would output, you know, some sort of serialization of these objects. And then they would build an add-in for another of these, you know, desktop apps that could read that JSON object and deserialize it back into this architectural or, you know, engineer, you know, whatever, structural beam or something. So it was built, it was about building all these connectors that would plug into these environments that weren't very easy to, um, to interrupt data right, in and out. Right. And on top of it, you know, you would have a web platform. I think they call it like streams or something. And, and that way you could take data from one thing and plug it into another, you know, kind of see them all online together and share them, for example. So there's some, you know, really interesting ideas about collaborating, tracking them. And that's only possible because you take them out of these desktop apps because a lot of them are not really built for this type of co co collaboration or yeah. this type of data sharing. Yeah, that's a really interesting idea. Like these things do not support any sort of interoperability, but if we can just get stuff in and out of any one of them, we could be that middle ground, right? Yeah, yeah. so I don't know a ton about this. I, I really basically just skimmed the website and watched their explainer video, but it seems like some pretty cool open source stuff for people in this space, so they could you know, check that out, right? Yeah, and I what it's excited about them is that they're actually open source too. So, yeah. you know, a lot of software in, in AC is is, you know, they're, they're big companies and they're paid. And there's not a lot of example of uh, successful, you know, open source pro companies, essentially. They're, you know, they've actually been able to um, become a you know, real company with employees and raise money and they're open source. So it's really interesting to see them trying to build a, you know, successful open source model within the industry. Yeah, absolutely. Prod Vaughn out in the live stream says uh, two uh, double high fives for uh, Django <laughs> <laughs> for, for your app uh, eight. AEC that works. All right, so that's Speckle, which is cool, and then also Ladybug, Ladybug tools. Yeah, Ladybug is incredible too. Um, Ladybug's been around for a while. Um, I don't know how long, but it was actually one of my first uh, experiences. Expo one of the first times I got exposed to open source within AC industry as well. But um, they, it's essentially it started. It was a bunch of Python tools that would help you, you know, do kind of environmental analysis and. Uh, they would basically use like weather data and some existing products. I forgot that it's been a while since I, I used this, but they would essentially wrap around these heavier duty um, programs that could actually do like daylight simulation or, you mm -hmm. know, like solar analysis, but they would, you know, they would build an interface uh, in Python that you could use within, um, or well, Revit wasn't too much later, but Rhino and some of these other AC applications. And, you know, the outcome of it was that you would basically, it would, it would allow any kind of architect, you know, students to essentially take any type of building that they were designing and actually run and see what does this building look like throughout the year? You know, what does mm -hmm. sun hit or what does light look like inside and actually render these analytical kind of drawings from it. Um, so it was really interesting. It, it, it made all of that kind of accessible to a lot of people that wouldn't have been able to otherwise. And yeah. I think it was entirely written in Python for a long time. Yeah, it says cross-platform ladybug tools is written in Python, which can be run almost anywhere and plugged into any geometry engine, which is great. And then it talks about having some visual aspects of harnessing the capabilities of CAD to produce a variety of interactive 3D graphics, which, you know, producing cool interactive graphics in Python is always fun. But yeah, this one's also free and open source. Yep, that's right. I think they've received some uh, grants from the... Uh, Department of Energy or something like that. They they're, they're okay. pretty well supported. Yeah, and it's ninety nine point eight percent Python. <laughs> a lot of Python and, and uh, 02 percent other. It's probably Maybe marked that's down. Probably, yeah. I, I'm guessing it's the uh, the one shell script <laughs> and the uh, requirement uh, txt here. So yeah, that's right. Pretty awesome. All right, so all that stuff is super neat. Um, you know the work that you're doing here to shine a light on the different ways we can automate stuff. You know we've in architecture, we've got Revit and then the the PyRevit and um, the Python Revit wrapper and then what, Rev, RevTron, you said. And then also these open source like connectors and interoperability platforms are all super neat. I do want to talk to you about one other thing that doesn't have a super clear connection, but is also, it sounds like it came out of your time at WeWork, this the stuff you did with Airtable. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, yeah? that's right. So Airtable... It's something that I've seen. I've I've had people tell me that oh, you definitely have to work with Airtable. It's it's amazing. It's like 
sheets or Excel, but way nicer or things like that. Tell us, you know, tell people out there, Airtable is this commercial product, right? Tell us about this and then we'll get to some Python side of things in a moment. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm a huge fan of Airtable, you know, I've, pretty much since the first time I've, I've sort of run into it, I've been a user and I use it for everything, personal projects, work, but, you know, I, I define it as this kind of, you know, Google Sheets meet, you know, relational database. And I, I think there are other products like it, but I find their table just really kind of a joy to use. Yeah, I also feel and, like there's a Trello Kanban board aspect of it as well, right? Yeah, they, they've been adding, you know, quite a few kind of like views and, and, and tooling on top of the underlying data. So um, there's some interesting things you can do, you know, it's not as as sort of pure of a of a you know kind of tracker as Trello is, but you can basically build a Trello like interface, and you know there's a Kanban mode, so you can whatever your your roles are, you know if you have certain fields, so for example you could maybe have a uh, you know a table with like apartments you're listing for example, and maybe you have a column that is the status whether you've visited them or not, and in Google Sheet, you would maybe type it or do like a data validation. In Airtable, you can actually say, this is a field that links to this other table. Right. I hear the options that I want. And you can kind of create truly kind of relational um, uh, data, you know, and, and nice. have these views be linked to each other and in some really interesting ways. Yeah, cool. Uh, so it's, it's a little bit like spreadsheet meets relational database that has relationships rather than just random stuff you type in Excel, right? Yeah, that's right. Cool. All right, so that's Airtable. The Python side of things is you created this thing called Pi Airtable, which is a Python client for the Airtable API, right? Yeah, so I think yeah, one of the... About this. Yeah, it actually, the, the initial version of this was was uh, during my time at WeWork as well, but you know we had all these Airtables that would store, uh, I think one of them was like a furniture database. So every row was a piece of furniture and you had all this detail about these objects, you know, maybe some some data. And now you wanted to use that in other places um, or you wanted to feed additional data in that in that table. So Airtable exposed an API, but the API, you know, it's, it's somewhat simple and minimal, but you know, it works, it's effective. Uh, so this, this was originally called Airtable Python Wrapper and it was uh, recently renamed to Pi Airtable, but it's a, just a, a kind of a lightweight Python client around. It just, it adds a lot of the kind of nuances about the, the, the API itself, you know, some of the data types um, and just kind of a high level interface so that you can just kind of import it and you don't have to go, you know, look, spend too much time in the documentation, figure out what all the HTTP requests are. And it just wraps mm -hmm. them up and handles a lot of the, a lot of the things and add some, you know, nice high-level abstractions uh, to make it really easy to use. In this, I've been working on this project for probably maybe three years now, mm -hmm. and it was really interesting because in the beginning it was just, you know, me and I thought it was useful to have this, and I just kind of put it out there, and it was really fun to see, uh, like, people coming into the repo and actually, you know, asking questions or, you know, um, opening, you know, bug tickets, and in some cases, like, I've had people just do lots of contributions like this this one this one person came out of nowhere one day and just like rewrote a test suite for it i had these <laughs> i had these the initial test suite I, I guess i didn't know any better would actually make calls to the api and it was hard because the state wasn't predictable the tests were a bit slow so i, I guess when i did that I, I i didn't know you should sort of mock your requests and run your test that way instead and they literally came and like rewrote all my test suites uh so it was, it was really fun and it's been nice. kind of one of the longer running um open source projects that i've had and and over time i've just gotten better at kind of maintaining added features and then more recently uh just kind of rebranded you know aspire table you know, build new documentation, and it's been really fun to see the project grow. And um, it's got a it's got a decent you know user base. So I, I often see people coming up in there. And you know, I, I search GitHub every once in a while, and I see it used in a lot of different places. So it's it's really cool to see. Yeah, that's fantastic. So you said it has two hundred thousand downloads a month, and it's a, listed as the official Python Airtable uh, library, right? In the Airtable docs. Yeah, I asked, you know, I assume those 200,000, a lot of them are CI, <laughs> you know, I, sure. I don't know how many are actual, you know, direct installs, 
uh, but you know it does get used yeah and then the air yeah, that's, still, that's still not that's not nothing right still that's a lot right even if it's a quarter yeah, yeah. still a ton of people using the library yeah it's pretty exciting and then you know recently i think it was about a month ago or so they added to the official documentation as the you know community uh driven kind of python client and they didn't have any others listed before that so yeah i think that's that's bringing even more people nice and so you said it also has some orm capabilities yeah so this was really fun you know i i would always use this library whenever i i needed to work with Airtable, but i would oftentimes want to build classes for the models that I had, you know, I was always, mm -hmm. I love, you know, using Django and these different type of ORMs. I, I think it's a really fun way of kind of working with uh, persistence. And oh, yeah. I wanted to do something like that with Airtable. So uh, I, in this the recent release, I, I basically kind of tried to build my own little ORM. And the idea is that I, I would define, for example, if I had an Airtable that it was, you know, contact, you know, name, first name, email or something, I could essentially, you know, define a class called contact and then inherit from this Airtable base model and then define the fields. And then I could just instantiate that class and, and say, you know, dot save, and it would fire the request to basically save it. I could update an attribute and then just hit save and you would update it or, you know, call it delete method. Um, so it was really fun. I, I don't know how much that's used. It's kind of a new feature, but I had, Tons of fun uh, building it, and I got into descriptors, which I had never used before. Yeah, descriptors are wild. Yeah, they were really crazy. Um, so you know, you had to define, you know, these are the attributes this model should have. But when you actually instantiate, they behave very differently. You want to get the actual value, but not the, you know, the kind of the field type. So descriptors uh, were sort of the, the natural answer, I think, to it. But it, it was really fun building it. Right. And you've got like text fields and email fields and even checkbox fields, which I don't typically recall from the Django ORM or SQL. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's an air table. Uh, right, right, right. Type. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. You even have links from one air table to another. Cool. Yeah. I didn't realize it had this ORM aspect to it. This is very neat. Yeah. So when you, when you fetch a record from air table, if it if it's a link, you actually just get the ID. It doesn't actually mm -hmm. like transverse the link. So uh, if you define it as a you know as a link field, it actually takes that ID and fetches the next one, and then actually gives you the object instead of the ID. So yeah, perfect, like a foreign key type of yeah, uh, exactly. relationship thing. Awesome. All right, anything else you want to throw out there about um, Pi or Table before we wrap this thing up? Uh, no, no, that's it. Yeah. So if people are out there using Airtable and they want to treat it like an ORM. Or they just want to talk to it. Yeah. It sounds like you should check this out. Yeah. I actually have a, I ha I have a, a blog post I wrote when I, uh, maybe about a year ago that was called, you know, using Airtable as a backend uh, on Medium. And it was, it was the initial version of AC that works instead of Jang having a Django backend. I actually tried to build it with just, you know, an Airtable uh, serving it. And it was interesting. You know, it's not, you you won't have all the guarantees you have from a you know from a proper database, but it's a really easy way if you just want to put data somewhere and be able to fetch it, and you also get a free kind of UI that you can see the data and change yeah. it. So yeah, it's kind of like the admin backend of Django, but it's like this super rich yeah thing yeah. in in the form of Airtable, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, very nice. I mean, maybe it's not a full acid transactional database, but at the same time. If that's where people are putting the data, you don't want to put it into Postgres and then try to keep the thing in sync or something like that. Doesn't sound fun either, right? So, use the one place that holds the data if that's what you're doing. Yeah, exactly. You, you won't get. I mean, I think if you're doing this, you're probably not. You won't be replacing a Postgres, but it would maybe be replacing just like a local file or something. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you do get. You know, you get some form of like revision. You know, it keeps track of every change. Um, so you get you get a lot for free. Yeah, very nice. Yeah, people should definitely check that out. All right. Well, we're about out of our time, so let me ask you the final two questions here. Cool. If you're going to write some Python code, what editor do you use? I I think these days it's probably always VS Code, right? Or <laughs> big big percentage of it. Yeah, there's yeah. there's definitely a big chunk. Yeah, I had a little, you know, I. My first one was Notepad plus plus. Then I think I used Adam, Sublime for a while, and then Adam, and then end up in VS Code. And these days, I I just I love the 
the Python integrations that the team that there has built. So uh, I, I couldn't really see myself moving away from it anytime soon. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's very, cool. Very invested in it. <laughs> uh, there's a lot of action going around on with VS Code in general, and then also in the Python aspect of it, right? I do feel like this Sublime to Atom to like almost everyone who is on that path, VS Code is the destination. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. It just kept getting easier, you know? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Cool. All right. And notable PyPI package. I mean, you've already given us many different packages and things for people to check out, but something that, you know, you ran across, you're like, oh, this is cool. I really got to tell people about this one. Yeah, I, I don't, I think this is not a, this is not a secret package. I think it's a pretty well known, but mm -hmm. I, I, I just really come to enjoy using uh, Pydantic. Mm -hmm. um, I, it's one of those that I think I added on pretty much every project. I, I, I have. I think it's such a blast just to be able to define my classes and uh, set the types. I, I really enjoyed the, the way the project came together, and uh, it's sort of one of the standard ones that I added everywhere now. Yeah, if you have to parse data into your model or turn your model into something like JSON, it really helps a lot, especially if you have yeah. a hierarchical model, right? I've got this thing that contains a list of other pedantic models, and then you got to do type conversions to date times or to numbers or stuff like that. Yeah, it's fantastic. Yeah, and, and even on projects where you're, you're collaborating with other people, uh, you know, you, you have a sort of, you know, my pie first kind of approach, right? Where from the very beginning, your, your objects are kind of typed. And that just makes it a lot easier to collaborate with other people that will jump into your project. And it's very clear, you know, what that object is and all the types. Yeah. So that yeah. kind of helps make sure that you, you stick with it. Yeah, absolutely. Good recommendation. I suspect people probably have heard of it as well, but it's, yeah. it's definitely a good one. Yeah, I've had Samuel on the show uh, to talk about it. All right, final call to action. People, especially those out in architecture, engineering, construction, are excited about Python and some of the tools. What do you tell them? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a, you know it's an exciting time for the construction industry. It's kind of a really good place to to innovate. There's a lot of exciting um, technology products and companies being built. So I think there's a lot of opportunities, you know, to do something in kind of a different space. And um, I think they can really benefit from you know experience people that have been you know doing more traditional software development to help them, you know, scale and, and build things. So. Um, yeah, it's interesting to see how that you know those kind of streams cross in to see architects going to build software and also seeing engineers coming to help make the you know architecture and construction industry better. Yeah, fantastic. All right. Well, thank you so much for being here. It's been great to have you on the show. And I'd just love to get these views into the different areas and communities where Python is making a difference. So Thanks for sharing it in the architecture space. Nice. My pleasure. Yeah, you bet. See you later. Thanks, Michael.